Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me to talk at this series. And it's really great to hear how many people are interested in mycology, how many people signed up for this talk. And it's lovely to see so many of you here. Um, as Norman said, I'm Martha Crockett, and I'm going to talk about the role of citizen science in mycology. So the talk includes, um, first of all, a bit about me. If you've Googled me at all, you'll see that I'm not currently employed in mycology. So I thought it's worth giving a bit of background about me and my relationship to mycology. Then I'm going to talk about why we need citizen science, specifically in fungal conservation. I'm going to be focusing on the role of citizen science in fungal conservation. Um, then I'm going to talk through a framework that helps to understand and increase the impact of citizen science. I'm gonna give you some example citizen science projects that are a bit different to um, uh, what you might ordinarily think of as citizen science projects. And then I'll move on to some take home messages. Um, so first of all, um, just a little bit about me where I'm from. I grew up in Norwich. I did my undergraduate degree at Cardiff University in biology. And that's where I um, met um, Professor Lynn Boddy, who taught a really fantastic undergraduate module in fungi in my second year, and I was hooked then. I spent some time at the Henry Doubleday Research Association in the middle of my degree, a year temping in Brighton. Then I went back to Cardiff, and that's when I really started um, focusing on fungi. I'd done my final year undergraduate project with Lynn, and then I went back to do a PhD on the ecology of four rare species of wood decay fungi, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, I stayed at Cardiff for a postdoc, and after a ski season in the Alps, I came back to Oxford uh, to live in Oxford and worked in citizen science with Earth Earthwatch Europe for over a decade. Um, since last summer, I've been working with the Oxford Treescape project. So, like I said, Lynn in my second year really got me hooked on fungi. Like most people in the UK, I finished school just having the barest knowledge about fungi, despite having done A-level science courses, I did biology and so on. I think what I found fascinating about fungi is the more you learn about them, the more different they are from plants and animals. Of course, they're more re re closely related to animals, but they seem to the casual observer perhaps more like plants. And I've put this photo up because um, it's my favourite photo that I've ever taken of anything to do with mycology because it, it really highlights what I find fascinating about them. You can see those mushrooms there, those fruit bodies, I should say, the big white lumps um, down here. You can, in this case, see where um, this white area is... Um, where that white mushroom is grown within the wood, decomposing the wood, breaking it down, in sharp contrast to this dark brown area where that fungus is not growing. And in between, them, you can see this zone line, this black line, where the fungus that's growing in that white area, which is the white rock fungus, is um, producing either defense or attack chemicals. It's keeping hold of its territory, it's protecting its territory from whatever is in the rest of that wood there, and it's producing chemicals along that interaction zone line. So fungi are not just these passive organisms just growing any which way. They have interactions with, with other fungi within their substrate. And of course, this is a minor point, but you, I just love the way that um, there's that clear delineation of where they're growing. Fungi, of course, grow along when they're, would decomposing composing fungi, the mycelium, that thread-like network of hyphae, grows through the structure of the wood longitudinally through it, and you can really see that here. Um, and fungi really um, stayed with me. I've just found them fascinating since that second year undergraduate module. Um, when we were in Brighton, I went to, uh, to a work event with my husband, and somebody asked me what I did. I said that I was doing a PhD in fungal conservation and the guy I was speaking to was worked in waste management council and he said, what the bloody hell are you doing that for? And um, it, it can be really difficult to articulate, but of course I'm sure most people here would appreciate that fungi deserve as much, um, as much attention as other organisms. In fact, they need it more because they're overlooked. 
So for my PhD, I was looking into the ecology and conservation potential for these four rare species of fungi. Um, they're all found in the UK and in other countries. And it's these four species because um, they're all protected by UK law under the Schedule 1981 Wildlife Schedule Eight of the 1981 Wildlife and Countryside Act. Um, and so my PhD was funded by Natural England. They're all found in old growth forests. So their habitat is under threat, which could be a contributing factor to their rarity. So the first three species, um, on the left, Tericium coralloides, the coral, fung coral tooth fungus, Tericium aeronatus, the hedgehog fungus, and Tericium serratum, the tear tooth fungi, they all grow on beech in old, for old growth forests. The rare oak polypore also grows in older areas, but that's mature oak parkland, and again, a very rare habitat. Another thing that links them is you just don't know that much about them. So during my PhD, I looked at various aspects of the life cycle of all four of these species. Um, everything from um, how the spores produced and how they travel out of the fung out of the fruit body, how far they go, um, what causes them to germinate. Is that a problem? Maybe lots of the spores that are produced are sterile, they're not in the right conditions. Um, we looked at clues how to establish them in the wild and how well and how competitive the different species are. Um, some of my PhD was like this, out in the woods, um, getting actually out there and seeing my study organisms, but most of it was in the lab like this. There were a lot of agar plates, there was a lot of time in the lab. Um, key findings for me were that um, there's potential inbreeding in the rare oak polypore in the UK, we found that out. Um, we also looked at even more basic, we just we looked at the, how mating happens in these fungi, which hadn't been known before, and so we uncovered what the mating system for the species uh, is. And another thing that I found really fascinating was that um, when spores germinate, mycelium grows out, and it has to meet mycelium of another, the same species that's compatible to mate and then be able to produce fruit bodies. In one of my species, Heresia marinaceus, the unmated mycelium was a better competitor than the mated mycelium. It's a bit detailed, but it, I think it, re it really turns it on it, things on its head because people usually look at, um, they take, when they're looking at how fungi are growing in agar and what they're using that to think about what they might do in the wild, they would use mated mycelium from a, from a fruit body. This was just a different way of looking at it, perhaps open thoughts to what might happen there. So during my PhD as well, I was, um, I started to have, I had my first experience of fungal outreach. I took part in Anthony Gormley's one and other project in Trafalgar Square, where for a hundred days, a different person got one hour on the fourth length of Trafalgar Square to do exactly what they wanted. 2,400 different people, no limits at all. And I decided to use my hour on the plinth to talk about the importance of fungi. Um, Unfortunately, I was allocated 3 to 4 a.m. on a Sunday morning, but despite that, people turned up, including my uncle, who's here tonight. He produced this wonderful narrative blog of coming out to see me on that night. And I was also accompanied by this whole range of people from Cardiff who were doing their PhD and their bodies there. And I was, the strings there, me throwing down these little balls of uh, fabric to um, represent um, mycelium um, coming out and fungi linking up with each other. Um, and I really enjoyed that experience of trying to get people interested in fungi, thinking what aspects of fungi can interest people who don't know anything about them. I then moved on to um, Earthwatch. I left research behind. I'd, I'd finished my PhD being fascinated by fungi, but not thinking that a career in research was necessarily for me. Um, for a decade, I was um, working on forest ecology and carbon cycling. Um, which is, of course, very related to that wood decay fungi stuff that, that I was doing before, because fungi decomposing wood is a key part of the carbon cycle. Um, I did, however, build in a number of um, projects to do with fungi in my time there. I wrote a review paper on how fungi um, operate at fungal at, at woodland edges 
Woodland edges tend to be warmer and drier with greater fluctuations of temperature and moisture than further into the wood. That different microclimate really influence perhaps what species of fungi are there and how they operate. We followed that up with a, a, um, a research project where we found that the decomposition rate at the forest edge was significantly lower than in the core. And that effect um, went on for about 100 metres from the forest edge. So if people are looking at um, carbon cycling in forests, certainly from a wood decay perspective, you really need to be taking wood edges into account. Um, I said this was citizen science work at Earthwatch. I took hundreds of people out, mainly corporate um, members of staff from our corporate partners into the woods to help collect our data on forest carbon cycling. And with all of these people, there would be some element of fungi there. It was great introducing people to fungi. We ran with the British Mycological Society and the Biological Society a workshop on fungi forest ecology. Wonderful. I was on the BMS Education and Outreach Committee for a while, and I had one idea for a citizen science project called Toad, Sto Toad Schools, which I'll talk about later on. And I started moving into sustainable agriculture at the end of my time at Earthwatch, which is how I then ended up from last summer working for the Oxford Treescape Project. And we mapping, um, using mapping to support nature recovery in Oxfordshire, working with parish councils and land managers in partnership with the University of Oxford and many others. Um, so I do that three days a week and I have some spare time, which is great. So when I left Earthwatch last summer, um, for the first time in a long while, I had a bit of brain space and I did find my thoughts returning to fungi. Um, so I, I've had some time to talk to events such as such as this. I've got time in the day to prepare for things like this. I'm doing a tiny bit of teaching at Oxford University, not to do with fungi actually. But when I first left Earthwatch, I was actually thinking about maybe growing mushrooms for eating. And I, I started reaching out to other people locally and started getting a little group of people interested in fungi locally. Not so much, uh, of course there are foray groups, but all the ecology and the potential for um, growing. I've looked into supporting the local city farm, um, getting them involved in growing fungi, having a UK Fungus Day event there. And I've set up this embryo citizen science project in White and Wood, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, and then papers. I've started, um, I started reading up about citizen science in mycology and jotted down ideas for a paper. And I found out that some other people did something similar and I teamed up with a group of mycologists from around the world, headed up by Dr. Danny Halewaitis. That paper about the use of fungi in, um, about the use of citizen science and fungal conservation hasn't been written, but we did put together a, um, a symposium for the um, Mycological Society of America, which started to crystallise my thoughts about fungi and citizen science. And um, as part of that, I created a database of fungal citizen science projects, which was the starting point for the ideas that I'm going to present in the next few slides. So first of all, what is citizen science? Um, a really simple definition is meaningfully involving volunteers in any part of the research process. Um, so, and in this talk, I'm going to make a distinction between what I'm going to call volunteer mycologists who come to the table with some pre-existing interest in or knowledge of fungi, and what I'm going to call simply volunteers, members of the public who don't have any experience of, um, of working with fungi previously. Now, typically in fungal conservation, citizen science, we would involve people at the data collection stage here um, and that submitting species records, either that's targeted searching for particular species or just more general sightings from forays when people are feeding their records into the local record centre or the Mycological Society database or other uh, places. And this type of citizen science, I would say, is the basis of our knowledge of species distributions and it underpins conservation mycology. Um, however, there are um, lots of examples of committed, knowledgeable volunteer mycologists working informally with professional researchers at other stages of the research process. For example, um, 
identifying research questions such as bringing um, attention that a species is changing its host or fruiting season or that perhaps a single species is in fact a complex of more species. Um, and volunteer mycologists could also be involved in other stages, for example, reporting findings in mycology field journals or designing research methods. Um, so, and of course, there are other projects where simple volunteers who don't have experience of fungi can get involved as well. Now, given the extent to which our knowledge of the distribution of fungi relies on volunteer mycologists and volunteers, I would argue that we need to maximise the impact of citizen science at all stages of the, stages of the research process and understand how we can maximise um, the way that we use volunteer mycologists. So why do we, so just a bit more about why we need citizen science in fungal conservation. Um, Fungi, as I've already said, are an overlooked taxon, and I don't need to tell you guys this. Anyone who's interested in fungi um, will know that it's not widely taught in schools and that most people just don't understand fungi. So we need to make use of people who are interested. Um, we've got the twin crises of climate, um, climate change and biodiversity loss. And of course, just as with other groups of organisms, fungi and, and their, their habitats and the ecosystem services that they provide are threatened. Um, Mycology remains a niche study area, even in universities at undergraduate and research level. Um, you can do a degree in zoology, botany, a very few mycology degrees. And I think that citizen science, it's already, as I said, I think it underpins our knowledge of species distributions. But I think we, with um, careful thinking about how best to employ this technique of citizen science, we can even further increase the impact of volunteer mycologists and the public at large. So I apologize, this is a bit of a, a wordy slide, but um, I really, when, when I started putting together this database of fungal citizen science projects, I started to see that there are different, they're not all just to say, they're not just all about um, collecting species records. There, there are subtle differences between them. And I found that this framework for the impact of citizen science really helped think about different types of projects. And this was designed by Toast van Norwijk and colleagues um, last year. Um, there are four models, four different types of citizen science that I'm going to talk about. There's place-based community action is the first one. And that is a citizen science project that's really rooted within a community where people are involved they care about some aspect of the locality, whether it's a particular species or a, habitat, or a habitat. Interest group investigations are when um, citizen scientists already have a subject matter specific knowledge. And this is often the case in mycology where we have a huge role for volunteer mycologists. Captive learning is when research is undertaken at a particular time and place with the researcher present and the people are learning and working directly with the researcher. And the final model is mass participation. And this is when members of the public can um, become casual citizen scientists without any ongoing commitment or previous subject knowledge. And in mycology, this might be submitting records of a, of a easy, very easily identifiable uh, fruit body, such as the fly agaric. It could also be submitting environmental samples to a lab for analysis, which I know has with samples around the um, and I should say that this framework, I think it's, I don't think every project could be pigeonholed into these areas. It's just, it's a useful way to um, expand things. So that's the research, those are the different research models. And then what we have are different areas of impact. There's environmental management, where an outcome from the project would be that, um, the data from that project informs management decisions in a particular area, um, generally place-based and firmly rooted in the local area. Um, uh, there's evidence for policy where data from these projects support policy change at different levels um, or evaluate the effectiveness of an environmental policy, something like that. 
behaviour changes where people who are taking part in the project are motivated to change their own behaviour. And that's most likely to happen if the project has a clear call to action. Social network championing is not just about posting on Facebook and Twitter. It's, um, in, it's um, people influencing um, non-participants both online and offline. So that's, if you took part in a fungal foray at the weekend, then you go and tell your friends about it. That would be social network championing. There's political ad advocacy where if a project is designed in mind, then um, volunteers might would be um, motivated to contact political uh, to contact people in political power to advocate for a particular outcome based on taking part in this particular project. And the final one is community action, and that's where um, the outcomes citizen science project would um, lead to collective action to address local environmental issues. So it might be that it's difficult to think of a, an actual uh, a theoretical example in mycology might be a community coming together and making sure and, and agreeing that they're all going to have deadwood piles in their garden to promote fungi in their local area. Um, so the aim of showing this is really the aim of looking at citizen science in this way for mycology is really to start thinking outside the box in terms of what citizen science can achieve. Um, I would love researchers to be thinking critically about designing and, and volunteer mycologists as well, sorry, to be thinking critically about how to design a citizen science research project to get maximum impact. Um, the idea is that the different research models can lead to different types of action. So um, I'm going to move on to some examples of different research models and show how I how they give examples of how they can So the first one is the project that I alluded to earlier. This is um, grew out of an idea I had at Earthwatch. Um, at the time it was called um, Toad Schools. Um, uh, that was an idea that a colleague had. It was put out to the vote, actually, what we should call this new project. And the most votes were for toad schools because it's about, well, mushrooms in the general public's eyes, toad stools, but it was happening in schools. So we ended up with toad schools. Um, and this is an example of a mass participation project where the, uh, the outcomes, the project itself isn't tied to a particular location. You're unlikely ever to meet the scientists involved and you don't need any prior knowledge to participate. So it's open to all sorts of volunteers. Um, so the idea behind this project is um, to, or the aim of this project is to try a method to understand fruiting of um, potentially just common species. Um, to understand a bit more about um, the fruiting uh, what, what makes them fruit, but also potentially what climate change implications there are. Um, my original idea was to colonise logs with a particular species of fungus. I was going to go for the oyster mushroom for ease and because it's going to be in schools, they're not poisonous. Brilliant. Um, and I wanted to have colonised logs on a north-south temperature gradient across all of the UK and an east-west um, moisture gradient. And then you'll be able to see when this same species produces fruit bodies and when it doesn't under different environmental conditions. Um, because of course, we don't usually track what common species are doing. Sometimes people record common species when they're out on a fungal foray, but how often do people not record them? And absence of a record doesn't mean it wasn't there. So I thought this was quite a neat idea for um, getting a handle on, on um, fruiting of common species but also um, trialing this method, what I've been doing in Whiteham. So in Whiteham Woods, sorry, which is a research woodland just outside Oxford University, outside Oxford, been associated with the university for many years. Um, we've colonised logs with oyster mushroom and we put them out and they're going to stay there for um, at least three years. And I'm going to ask people, we're going to put a QR, there's going to be an information board with a QR code so that as they walk in the woods, the woods are open to the public. As they walk in the woods, we're going to ask people to um, uh, using this QR code to report whether the fruit bodies are present, but also when they're absent as well. This is also a nice um, 
way it's it's also an engagement project it's also about getting people to start thinking about um fungi. So there'll be some links to further information on the board and this is in white words it's very much a trial we've just got two sites with five blogs in each but I, I, what i'm interested to see is whether this qr code reporting method works are people interested in a bunch of blogs that are there can we make the information board exciting enough to win so that's the project that we're trialing in white and woods um so oh yes uh, sorry we're also recording um microclimate using microclimate sensors so moving on to a more established mass participation project this wax cat watch which was established in 2020 by plant life and the public um survey grassland for wax cat fungi which are used as indicators of ancient unimproved grassland we've lost 97 percent that habitat in the UK. It's incredibly important. It's really easy to participate. You just download an app and within the app you um, record site characteristics and then you go walking and you see if you can see these wax caps. You go out at the right time of year obviously and also when it's wet. Um, and the app doesn't help you ID fungi, it um, records the colour of fungi. Because the wax caps are very obviously um, bright coloured, it's difficult to mistake them for other species. Um, so it means that it's very easy to use this, this not IDing app, but to use the, the, the colours um, to uh, just indicate whether key wax caps are there or not. Um, and the sites are then graded by a traffic light system according to the number of colours seen viewable on this online map. And it's a key um, component of any citizen science project is to let people understand what they've contributed to, to give them feedback. And this kind of um, simple, this kind of map allows people to do that. One thing that's really fascinating about this, sorry, about this project um, is that it started off just as an engagement project. Um, it was part of a wider project all about meadows and plant life wanted to keep people interested in meadows after the end of the wildflower season. Um, it went a lot further than that, uh, went a lot further than engagement because there were some really exciting impacts of this project. Um, we'd usually expect that a mass participation project would provide evidence, would be good at providing evidence for policy because it happens at a large scale. Um, if it can be targeted to produce behaviour change, and that's going to be effective. If it's planned well, you've got lots of people changing their behaviour. And of course, if you've got lots of participants, then they might be more people spreading the word in social um, networking, in that social network champion. Now, um, Wax Cat Watch is a relatively new project, and so there aren't detailed analyses of the findings available yet. But initial outcomes I found really exciting. Um, so in terms of evidence for policy makers, this shows the presence of, well, it shows it's, it's three key um, wax cap um, species. And the light pink lines are the number of sites that were found to have these species using the app. And the darker um, columns are the number of sites of those sites found in the wax cap survey that were new to National Resources Wales. It's close to 100% of them. It's astonishing. Um, 300 participants did over 500 surveys in the first year. It's clearly popular. And just look, I mean, National Resources Wales is the organisation responsible for environmental policy in, in Wales. And just this one year of data has highlighted so many new sites. Um, so that's um, a real win for, for policy. Um, the project managers of WaxCap are also, uh, of, the, uh, of this project are also looking into working with landowners to directly to better, ma to better manage sites that have been identified through this. Um, so there's also, this project is also, um, is also impacting environmental management. Um, and they're also working with local fun fungal foray groups to pinpoint new sites to survey, to do more detailed species surveys, um, which is really exciting. So for a project that started off just with an engagement remit, it provided some real impact as a tool that identifies important grassland sites that 
so they can be more appropriately managed and protected. And I think this is actually especially important with drive tree planting, which the government has in light of climate change. We really need to identify, manage and protect these um, grassland sites. Um, I wanted to talk as well. So this is another type of project that was mass participation project. There's interest group projects. And this is the project Fungi Lost and Found. And I'd be amazed if some of you here haven't taken part in the project. I bet I bet some people on this call took part in it. It ran from 2014 to 2019, um, led by Brian Douglas at Kew Gardens in collaboration with uh, BMS and the British Lichen Society as well. And it's been described as a treasure hunt um, for a list of the 100 most threatened fungi in the UK. And it's funded by the National Lottery, I should probably add. Um, and the idea uh, was to encourage and support volunteer mycologists, so people who are um, out there looking for fungi anyway, to target searches for these species to discover which were truly rare and which were just under recorded. Like I said, just because you haven't got a record for something doesn't mean it's not there. So over the course of the Fungi Lost and Found project, the LAF project, LAF 100 project, they found um, there are over 1,500 new records of these target species. They, spent, they found 77 of the 100 that they went um, to look out for. And um, that 1,500 new records is a 50% increase in records for those species. So a, a really great improvement on what they knew about these species. Um, they generated data that contributed to the red listing process for about um, 20 species. That's a global red listing. And they proposed um, UK conservation levels for all of the 77 target species that they found. So it's feeding directly into policy again. Um, they worked with, um, let's see, local recording groups in um, 92 counties of the UK's vice counties across the UK. And that was providing in-person and remote training and support. So upskilling volunteer mycologists. Um, they also ended up with more members of the public than anticipated um, taking part. Um, so it was part, what was intended mainly as a special interest group project in, in my, within my framework had a greater element of mass participation than intended in the end. And I understand that was mainly or largely through the Facebook page, which ended up um, having a lot of interest. Um, they, some of the, the findings were they rediscovered species that have been lost for over 50 years um, and unintended consequences included, um, unintended um, things that came up during the project were investigating the distribution of recently described species of fungi um, and new arrivals to the UK. They were able to, um, resolve some taxonomic difficulties, so, so um, understand, so highlight, disentangle species complexes, say, well, this is actually more species, or this, they look the same, but they're actually different species, and so on. Um, they described species that were new to science as well, so there, there were these really great um, impacts in terms of uh, evidence for policy, upskilling volunteer mycologists, but also these unexpected um, impacts. Um, which is similar to the uh, WAXCAP project as well, where they had those unintended policy. So let's have a look at how these impacts fit into the framework. Um, they, the interest group investigation is in expecting to have a lot of ticks and a lot of boxes. Um, and they did improve the knowledge of the distribution of rare fungi and found sites them, which would feed straight into environmental management of particular sites. Um, they definitely provided evidence for policy, as I said, feeding directly into red listing, um, so identifying which species need um, proper protection. Um, the project aimed to upskill and volunteer mycologists, so that could be argued as a type of behaviour change. In terms of social network championing, as I said, the project ended up being very um, active on Facebook and Twitter. Um, you don't know to what extent people shared um, that experience offline, but there was certainly the potential for that. Um, I'm not aware that there was a political advocacy element to this project, but I imagine that one could have been added, for example, a call for people taking part to contact 
um, MPs or local authorities about including fungi in national and local conservation priorities. Um, and finally, I should say, so I, I've opted, I'm not going to give, talk about um, captive learning projects at all, simply because I couldn't find any examples of them. But I'm going to have a quick look at place-based community action projects. Um, well, place-based community action projects are those that are rooted in a particular local community. And it was harder to find examples of these in fungi and citizen science. Um, and it's also harder to decide exactly what fits into this category. Most volunteer for fungal foray groups are defined by their location. For example, the Fungus Survey of Oxfordshire. Um, but I would argue that what brings these groups together is their interest in fungi rather than their interest in a particular location or community. I couldn't find any examples of truly place-based community action projects, but I can imagine um, how they how existing citizen science projects might be used by communities. For example, Wax Cat Watch could be used by a community interested in understanding the value of a uh, of a local meadow. Or um, this other project, which um, this other project, which is about um, fungi on oak trees, the Oak Tree Fungus Survey Project, IDs Fungi on Oak, and that could also be used as a tool by volunteers with minimal prior knowledge about fungi um, to better understand and eventually protect their local area. Um, so um, this place-based community action type of um, project has tick crosses in all of the boxes, in all of the potential areas of impact. I'm not going to go through them individ individually as I've talked about them on previous slides, but um, some of the reasons why they're so impactful are that being in a particular location, um, they're likely to provide targeted evidence for management in that location. Participants, people taking part in these projects are likely to be motivated to join because they've got strong personal links to the, um, the area. So it's increasing motivation to take actions for behavior change related to the project. Um, you've got a ready-made social community network which can support each other and the project. Um, and I think that can help keep these projects going sometimes, particularly if they're well supported, they're supported in a well-designed project. You've got researchers who are really um, researchers or very skilled volunteer mycologists who can really help um, shape, design and implement such a project. Um, just because there's a potential to impact all of these areas, it doesn't mean that these place-based community um, action projects are the best model for citizen science. Um, and these impacts can only be realised if they're built into a project from the very start. Um, it's not, as I say, it's not that it's the best model. I think there's a role for all these different models and understanding the potential for them to have impact in these different ways, not just providing data to understand species distribution is um, really important. So I'm wrapping up now. Um, in summary, um, I think citizen science is a very broad term and it covers a whole range of different types of um, engagement and projects. Um, there are grey areas um, between the different models and even the areas of impact that I've been talking about. The framework is not rigid. Um, I see it as a useful way to think about the whole, such a wide range of impacts that citizen science projects can have. Um, all the models can and should be used within conservation mycology and no one of those research models is any better or worse than the others. Um, it's easy to think of research outcomes, including citizen science projects, the number of papers that are published. Um, but of course, we're also considering the impact on target species or habitat in this con in this conservation context. And the framework that I've pre presented might help researchers or volunteer mycologists consider broader ways of achieving those conservation um, impacts. Um, citizen science is a research method like any other. It requires careful planning and understanding of audiences to increase the chances of success of achieving those impacts you want. I've been referring to citizen scientists very impersonally throughout this talk, but of course they are individual people. Considering, 
considering their motivations for joining and sticking with the project can be really vital to the project's success. I think probably, I was going to say particularly in um, special interest group projects, but probably in all of them actually. Um, of course, I haven't really referred to developments. I'm sure people have questions about idea, you know, the rise of um, mass participation projects with the ability, increasing ability to be able to identify fungi. Um, and things like, yeah, developments su development such as apps for IDing fungi um, and advances in um, molecular tools um, will, will change how people are involved in mycology. So it's a really exciting time, and I think it's more than ever important to really design projects properly so that questions are asked so that we can get the right outcomes, so that we can make the most of people wanting to take part in the projects. Um, like I said at the start, citizen science um, with uh, the, um, in terms of species records and um, amateur volunteer mycologists working with researchers is a cornerstone of conservation mycology. Um, there's also the potential to engage the public more, which is sorely needed. And I think what we really need to be doing is build on existing volunteer expertise and build public awareness to have that, to have a really effective base for citizen science to support my colleague, to support the professional mycologists and build our knowledge on fungi, fungal conservation in the UK. So um, thank you very much for listening. It's been really great to be able to share my love of fungi and these projects and citizen science this evening. And I just wanted to acknowledge these people that I've spoken to while putting these ideas together. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Martha. That was that was really, really interesting. Um, so if anybody's got any questions for Martha, would you please type them into the chat? Um, I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that and then I'll, um, I'll read through them so Martha can address those for you. Um, I just uh, wanted to note both the Plant Life Wax Cap project and the Oak Tree Fungus project are actually highlighted on our UK Fungus Day website at the moment. So I'm just going to share the link to those now in the chat. So if you're interested in either of those projects that Martha mentioned. Um, have you got any information or online at the moment about your project at the woods at Wedham Woods? No, it's, it's 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 not available yet. It no. will be hopefully in the next month or so. Oh, fantastic! Okay, so we can share yeah. that another time. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's a couple of comments. So uh, just a note from Carol. Um, Carol Hobart noted that the Lost and Found project, Hughes Lost and Found project, was funded by Esme Fairburn Foundation, not the lottery. <laughs> Yeah, I realised after I yeah, said, after you said it. Thanks for pointing out, Carol. <laughs> Just to note that. Yeah. Um, so there's a, so from Anne here, there's a, a comment from Anne. Um, she says, hi, Martha, a fellow Lynn Body PhD graduate. Um, she's developing a community garden in Derby and lucky that others on the project team are also keen on the role of fungi in the garden. Do you have any advice on engaging local people in fungal study when they perhaps automatically prefer to look at um, charismatic megafauna? Yeah, um, it, it's a tricky one because people love fairy things and they love things that move. Um, I think giving people a sort of some some sort of fascinating hook, like um, something to do with, um, I think the role of fungi, what fungi do, is is really important. So telling people about the role of, about mycorrhizal fungi and and the proportion of crops that rely on them with of trees something like that and, and the other thing is i don't know just yeah pictures of fungi just showing people the wide variety of fungi but this is the tip of the iceberg um yeah i think those type of things are what i would say yeah um thank you so um another question here oh i'm sorry there's a, there's a comment just note that a copy of this report uh, of this recording will be made available you can find it on the bms uh, youtube channel um, in a couple of days time it'll be up there so if you missed any part of, the, of Martha's talk from the beginning it, you'll be able to look at the recording. Um, so some uh, Mark Ramsdale here for the question do you have a feel um, on what might make some citizen science projects successful and some less successful so are there particular things about a project that you can 
that you can point to? Um, I think, so my experience has been as a researcher designing citizen science projects and working with other researchers who want to design them. And one trap that sometimes people fall into from a research perspective is thinking that doing a citizen science project as part of a larger programme will sort of tick a box of engagement. And I think that's a really big mistake because there's a huge potential for citizen science. If it's planned properly, it, it needs to be useful. It can't just be a little, a nice little add on flag that people use. It, it's got to be useful and really understanding what citizen science can do. The fact that it's people in mass participation, it's people um, dispersed in time and space. So my idea for having logs across the north, south, east, west temperature gradient, I, I couldn't visit all those sites, but if they're in if they were in school where people are every day, then you're actually using um, that citizen science model to get data that you couldn't otherwise. So I think really understanding what you want to achieve and um, planning it appropriately are, are the keys to success. And also understanding why people want, might want to take part in it. What balloon do they get? If they're going to take part in anything, they need to have a balloon to take home with them. They're not gonna take part just for the, well, maybe the fun of it, maybe they will take part for the fun of it, maybe that's why, but you need to think about people's motivation for taking part as well. Yeah, that's really important, yeah. Um, there's a question related to what you've just been saying, actually. So I'm, I'm actually jumping a question or two, but I will ask them in a moment um, relating to the recording of data. So you mentioned there that you couldn't physically be in all places in the country at once. So relying on citizen scientists to, citizen scientists to collect the data for you. Um, the question is from, from Kelly. Are there any concerns over misrecording of data through inaccurate species identification? And would this impact research? Um, yeah, so... So in the project that I was talking about, about having um, colonised logs in schools around the country, I wouldn't be so concerned about that there because the idea is that you fill your log so chock full of the, fu of the fungi of interest that nothing else has a chance to fruit there. And you'd, you'd have pictures of what fungus looks like. But if we're talking about the broader species records, then um, I think people, there'll be many people in the audience who know about this better than I do. But um, records, for example, in the... British Mycological Society, in the fungal records database of the Britain and Ireland. Yep. <laughs> yes, that's it. FRDBI. Yes, that's right. FRDBI. You have you have to have records confirmed. You don't to be used to, for research grade records. Um, certainly in um, not like in the end. There's the NBN Gateway, which is a sort of a, a UK wide species recording um, website, and there you have to have research research grade. Um, uh, research grade records of species would be con confirmed by someone with a particular level of expertise. So if you're a researcher, you would build that into your research model. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, any recommendations for ongoing projects to get involved in? Question from Caitlin. So thank you so much for your talk. It's very interesting, super interesting. Any recommendations? Um, well, I wish there were more. Um, that I knew of, uh, Wax Cap Watch is one that I'm certainly going to try for myself, myself this year, the Oak Tree Project, there are links to on the website. I don't know, the BMS for a while had a scheme for, uh, there was a leaflet, there were about eight or ten common fungi that they were particularly asking for records of, I don't know if that's still running or not. Not any longer, no, that did stop, um, we were running it a few years ago, but no, not any longer, yeah. Okay, so there aren't, I don't know of any other UK-based mass participation projects, what I would recommend is if you go on iNaturalist, people can set up their own local projects. Um, and sometimes there are some local projects where people are particularly recording fungi in a particular area. And I couldn't trawl through all of iNaturalist to find all of those in the UK. And the other thing to do, of course, is to get involved with your local fungal foray group, um, start upskilling and sub submit records, those vital records that help us understand the distribution of of species around the UK. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a question here from Robert says, I'm currently running the Great North American Fungi Quest and face a number of criticisms on the use of citizen science. Is this something you've encountered? Apparently they want to be called community science as opposed to citizen science. I'm just curious if I'm the only one facing these criticisms. So um, yeah, I know in America they prefer the term community science. I didn't, was the, um, the criticism just about the quality of data? 
I didn't Robert, do you, Robert, do you want to unmute? Is it just the use of the word? Semantics. Yeah, just the use of the word. I mean, for me, I you know, yeah, I'm in Canada, so personally, um, I haven't, I've only seen the 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 issues coming from uh, Americans, um, but uh, it seems to be something that's uh, a thing. Yeah, and just the word citizen science, people don't like. Right. Yeah, it, it's tricky. I, I, we, that's not an issue in the UK yet. Um, but I, I think, I mean, I don't. Yeah, it's not an issue I don't know much about. It's not a problem here. I'm not going to start speculating on things that I don't know about. Fair <laughs> Thanks for the question, Mary. Good point. Um, I think, oh, here we are. So Claire has just commented. She's a really interesting talk. Thanks, Martha. Um, Claire wrote an article in the NFBR newsletter about how support and encouragement I received via the Lost and Found Fungi project led me on to developing a wax cap ID tool as a citizen science learning project. And sh uh, Claire shared a link that oh. um wax cap id tool there um and, oh, and the, and the a bigger pardon to the um to the actual article as well so that's both in the chat there there's a link to the article and to the um to the wax cap uh, tool um also promoting a place-based approach to recording with a wet sussex wax cap atlas which is partly funded by the bms um, right. so she's commenting laugh was such a fantastic project it'd be great to see more like it so there are sort of spin-offs on that kind of idea again so. that's wonderful please do I, I i should say i'd be really keen to hear of any citizen science projects with fungi that people know about because I, I i suspect there are lots of maybe more local ones it's just not always possible to um but for me to find out about so please do put them in the chat or get in touch afterwards i'd love to hear about them yeah great thank you um so Ken is commenting, in the USA, we have the uh, www.fundis.org fundis, oh, fundis doing projects on rare fungi. Um, it's the second year for West Coast and the first year for East Coast America. Um, and also local fungi projects. It was created with the Lost and Found project in mind. So yeah, that, yeah. I'm very aware of that project. It's, it, it's a great one. And I think they're doing a lot with um, uh, ups, using um, molecular techniques, training, training up um, local fungi groups molecular techniques as well to really expand the skill sets it's yeah that's the project I'm thinking about. Mm. okay thank you um so that's all the questions for now I think uh there was a comment earlier from uh Gary and I'm just going to go back to that one Gary says uh thanks Martha inspiring talk I suggest a different name than toe schools so Gary's got another idea um since it involves numbers logs and changes how about logarithms Oh, I love it. That's really great. I will, <laughs> I will take that one. That's that's that, that's good. Any other ideas? I'm very happy to hear any other ideas for the project. I don't think I would call it Toad Schools if it ever goes wider, but um, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. I like it. <laughs>